uh, the Second Circuit on a panel that she was, was, was on ruled in this per curiam decision that, uh, that Kurt was talking about that there was no illegal discrimination in that. That even though clearly um, the, the reason that the uh, results of this promotion exam were thrown out was because the people who did well on it were the wrong skin color, um, that that wasn't a violation of the laws that make employment discrimination illegal or the part of the U.S. Constitution that makes it illegal for state and local governments to engage in racial and ethnic discrimination. That's the decision that's before the Supreme Court today. Uh, that's the decision that Judge Sotomayor wrote. And that's the decision that I think is going to be uh, front and center when the Senate Judiciary Committee asks Judge Sotomayor about what her judicial philosophy is and whether she is willing to follow written laws even when they are inconsistent with what she would prefer those laws to uh, say in, a, in the politically correct <coughs> universe that she would like to, to build for all of us. Uh, Manny. Um, well, just to start off, and to make my, um, my uh, uh, colleagues here envious of me, I, I was uh, uh, much like Sonia Sotomayor. I grew up in Queens, not the Bronx, like her father. My mother was a factory worker, uh, benefited from the Catholic school system of New York City. Uh, and probably like her, I made my own uh, breakfast in the morning and packed my own lunch and had all the experience of a latchkey child, of which there are many in New York City. Uh, that makes me more qualified to be a Supreme Court justice than uh, my colleagues to the, my left and right. And, and, then, and then, in addition to that, I'm an excellent merengue dancer. <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, have as a staple of my uh, uh, diet uh, black beans and rice. And uh, that really is a uh, factor that has been overlooked, that the rift that has been created by this president in favoring those who like red beans over those who like black beans. <laughs> uh, not to mention the, the rift over salsa, dancing sal salsa and the cumbia. Uh, and as you can tell, because I'm making light of it, I'm not a, a believer that a Supreme Court should look like the deck or the bridge of a Starfleet ship uh, in, uh, in its diversity. That's not the purpose. I would rather have somebody who is entirely unlike myself, uh, who loves the Constitution and respects its context and its text and will preserve it. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not where we are right now. It's, it's an unfortunate situation that we have a president who believes that a Supreme Court nominee, uh, a Supreme Court justice, uh, should favor some party litigants that come before them over others. That's not quite what we teach people when we spend billions of dollars, as, I, as I've been part of in Iraq, teaching people that judges should not uh, be biased towards any party litigants, that justices should favor the, the text of the law rather than uh, ignore the law or make it up as they go along. It is counter to what uh, we have been trying to do in so many countries, to make a constitution uh, an anchor for liberty. And that takes me back to something that George Washington, we should always start there. George Washington was asked uh, which of the three branches he would consider the, the most important. And unlike his... Uh, his uh, protege, uh, Alexander Hamilton, he said the third branch. Why? Because it would protect, he said, our liberties or take them away. And that's prescient, as the first president was wont to do, uh, and it has worked out exactly that way. Uh, we now have a situation where American constitutional law looks very little like the American Constitution. Uh, and that initial impulse that great democratic impulse in, in human history that, uh, that uh, was to write down the law and the Constitution uh, so that anyone could understand it without employing a lawyer, that has been relatively wiped away. 
Uh, to the extent that I had a professor at Vanderbilt University Law School uh, this spring uh, ask me, uh, and he was quite earnest, uh, do you really think that we should tether ourselves any longer to the text of the Constitution? And, and he, was, he was serious. Uh, and, uh, and that is, uh, and I'm sure he taught constitutional law. <laughs> I suspect that's why he was there. Um, and, and so just Judge Sotomayor is, um, is uh, a representation of that kind of thinking. And that's what I'd like to delve into because I don't think, um, I don't think uh, a lot of people have, uh, have focused on this, which is that, you know, she's going to be unique if she gets on the court. She's going to be unique in more than one way, not just the first Hispanic. She will be the product of her generation. She will be the product of an academic world uh, in which uh, she, from which she was benefited, in which she grew up, that is um, perhaps that, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm certain, actually, is not currently represented on the court. Uh, and that has not been, uh, we haven't paid attention to that. I suspect that what makes her, what influences her more than anything, more than being a wise Latina woman, is the fact that she is a product of this multicultural, uh, anti-heteropatriarchal, uh, militant feminist, uh, all of these things that we have seen in the past, especially in the past 25 years on college campuses. Uh, and she manifests all of those things. I'm not so much concerned, unlike my colleagues, about her rulings on the, on the appellate court. I'm not so much concerned about her as an appellate judge. Uh, and, I, and I don't know that her rulings uh, uh, are a problem, so long as she stays on the appellate court. <laughs> because if she were to stay on the appellate court, she would be restrained by all kinds of um, um, institutions and, and precedents and limitations and her own and colleagues and so on. My problem is that given her views and given the times and the course of history, that she will step up to be one of nine members of a court that uh, have shown themselves to take license with the Constitution and with the uh, divisions of power in the Constitution, that she will join those who view the Supreme Court as the tricameral uh, member of a legislative branch, uh, that, that the Supreme Court is the third chamber of legislature. And that is, that is very, very, uh, that is very daunting. Um, it, is, uh, uh, it is daunting, and yet, unlike some of my colleagues, not necessarily the ones with me today, but unlike some, I, I don't know that this nominee will be stopped. Uh, it could be, she could be stopped in a couple of ways. Some of, some of them have been articulated, particularly the combination of issues, particularly the combination of uh, well, all the issues that have been discussed, particularly guns and, uh, and uh, quotas, uh, also property issues. And that in combination with her temperament, because I agree with Kurt uh, that she's not, her temperament is not Ruth Bader Ginsburg's, David Souter's, uh, John Roberts's, uh, Alito's, uh, Breyer's. She's more like Bork from what we've read. I don't know the lady, but she's, you know, she may have that Hispanic gene, which only I can speak to, which desires to get in the last word. Uh, and uh, so it may be a very interesting uh, set of hearings, like Judge Bork's were surprisingly interesting. Um, but what bothers me, uh, given the fact that she is, uh, is likely to be confirmed, is that, well, let me put it another way. Uh, this confirmation debate affords an opportunity that we didn't have in the election, uh, most recent election. It affords the opportunity to show the American people the consequences of their vote. Uh, 